So, hello to everybody, dear colleagues, dear students, dear our guests. I am really happy that we can again meet in the frame of our lectures of our PhD study, Architecture and uh, Urbanism at the Faculty of Architecture and Design, in the frame of the subject Theory of Design. Our, our today, today guest is my, is my colleague, colleague, if I can, I can say, say it, because, because it's, it's a dean of the, of the Faculty of Art and, and uh, architecture, architecture in the University, University of Technology, Technology in Liberec, in Czech Republic, architect Osamu Okamura. I think Osamu, <laughs> welcome. It's not the first visit, your first visit in Bratislava, not, not the first visit in, at our faculty, but I think it's the first lecture of you at our faculty. So be, I, hope I hope it will be will. interesting, not only for our guests, but also for you. And now the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So many thanks to Pavel for the invitation to your faculty uh, here in Bratislava. I will just uh, be a little bit further away from you because uh, the cables are very short, you know, so I have to be, I, otherwise I would, I would just uh, come even closer, yeah. So, uh, today uh, I want to uh, speak about the importance of, uh, uh, let's say, interpretation of architecture towards the general public, yes. It's a, a topic that is connected with participation mainly, yes, and how to make uh, let's say the inhabitants of our cities and municipalities uh, aware of uh, urban planning related problems so that they could uh, take an active role. Uh, the name of the presentation is Visit Your City, Why Architecture Matters. Here in the region of uh, Central and Eastern Europe, we are facing a lot of negative trends. Yeah, these are quite similar all over the world. Yeah, so you can imagine uh, we have the sprawling shopping malls, uh, logistic centers. We have uh, lots of social stratification, gentrification. Uh, we have a lot of uh, social differentiation, the spreading car culture. Uh, that actually all of these phenomena are actually bringing a lot of tensions into our cities and our societies. Still, we are speaking of also aging, about uh, deterioration of the public, uh, pu public sphere, and maybe sometimes about the mismanagement of our cities. Yeah, so, but I'm not going to speak about this, so, uh, uh, this uh, today. Yeah. On top of that, uh, Definitely there are many global challenges that are kind of more general, are not uh, only about architecture and urban planning and mistakes in urban planning, as, as such as climatic crisis, such floods or extreme heat, economical crisis, political instabilities, global pandemics such as coronavirus pandemic, terrorist attacks and so on. So our cities are facing enormous, enormous challenges yeah, all over the world. But we are here in beautiful Bratislava. Yeah. So the question is, if we can speak about any problems in this beautiful city yeah, that looks so perfect, yeah, especially on the postcard pictures. Yeah. <laughs> Just to the contrast, yeah, this is the place where I was born. I was born in Tokyo, in the Takashi Madaira housing estate, in a modernist city designed by progressive urban planners for a new, modern, and ideal man, freed from all the burdens of the past, of the history, new hygienic standards, new norms, Ideal proportions, trees, sun, and fresh air. An ideal city free of any problems and conflicts. Ideally. In reality, 
a place with one of the highest suicide rates in all Japan. When we moved to Prague in the mid-1970s to one of the smaller new prefab housing estates on the suburb of Prague, everything was kind of very familiar to me in a modernist, unified, and spatially segregated city, I immediately felt at home. <laughs> Only my playground has changed <laughs> from stylizite Mount Fuji, yeah, you saw before, to a wall built of many identical concrete sewer pipes. We were able to play with friends here for hours. <laughs> However, not everyone was happy in this normalized world. In November 1989, the lined concrete pipes were replaced by lined members of the communist police. And against them stood people who no longer wanted to be normal or normalized, and wanted to live freely, democratically. This was at the very moment when I became intensely interested in architecture, and I began to study it. Criticism of modernism and modernist unified and functionally segregated and centralized urban planning at that time in Eastern Europe was with considerable delay had just culminated. I was also interested in new possibilities, how to deconstruct architecture or to conceptualize it only in one's mind, which my professor commented aptly in the words. Osamu, you decided to study architecture and not to design a single house. I probably misunderstood it as a compliment. <laughs> but after a few more attempts, my professor ran out of patience. And with the words, Osamu, don't solve your problems with architecture, he sent me to study conceptual arts. <laughs> Good teachers always know where the young person is heading. So at the conceptual art school, I finally started to focus intensively on architecture. But completely from the opposite end, I stopped thinking about buildings but I started to think about people. The city is not bricks and houses. The city is people and the relationships in between them. And empty and dysfunctional houses like this beautiful Baroque Jesuit college in the city of Yichin, which the locals name only as Russian barracks, only point to unhealed scars in our society. It was occupied by the Russian army after 1968. Together with the local high school students, I started working on the restoration of broken relationships in the city on something we might call today a social sculpture or a creative placemaking. My professor at the time commented briefly on my artistic efforts. This is no art. Any better mayor could do that. And he was right again. Architecture, the city, the society, and politics are places of contest, of often completely conflicting private interests or views of the world, 
which are often not even possible to reconcile with each other, but exist in a shared space, rather in parallel, side by side. However, there is nothing better than to be able to discuss the city in a cultured way. The Japanese fascinate me with their highly cultivated behavior. And when the world's best contemporary woman architect, Kazuyo Seijima, says, I imagine architecture as a big park for everyone. It almost sounds like a child said. I imagine architecture as a big park for everyone. It also sounds a bit zen-like. Certainly she doesn't mean by everyone a normalized individual, but a free person. I imagine architecture as a great park for everyone. But at the same time, fortunately, my father warned me, when the Japanese laughs, it means he or she is the most angry. <laughs> because today's cities are full of growing conflicts and tensions. And current urban planning must deal with them in a refined combination of strategy and tactics, often with the use of tools used by the military in military operations. Today's city will certainly not be rescued by a handful, a handful of planners today in the face of growing problems with the unavailability of housing, car traffic congestion, the city's economy threatening expansion to the landscape, or, any, or many others the city can't do without the active involvement of all its inhabitants. Today, we are no longer talking about smart cities. We are talking about smart citizens. But if you, because if you don't understand your city, you don't even own it. Today, more than ever, we are talking about the need to increase the livability and resilience in our cities. New York, Paris, Prague. At a time when in many cities of the developed world, dystopian visions of urban disintegration are becoming a reality. Chicago no longer speaks of the segregation of rich and poor, of white and people of color. But there is a talk of hyper segregation. In a single weekend, the city has up to 74 people shot and 12 of them fatally. This is the Chicago Architecture Center. I'm going now to go deeper in the operations and ideas behind this project. Because this is a very good case study how to look at architecture and urban planning as a tool to communicate 
also important ideas with the inhabitants of the city. This is a very famous picture. The very downtown of Chicago. This is the Fort Dearborn on the right, where the Chicago was actually founded. It's very historical, very historical, important historical place. And the Michigan Avenue, yeah, the uh, magnificent mile. We are in the very downtown. This is enormous building by very famous architect, Mies van der Rohe. But I'm only describing this to, so that you could focus on this little point here, red point. Big C and the red point. That's the place where the Chicago Architecture Center is located. Chicago Architecture Center is the biggest and most successful architecture center in the world. It has annual attendance of 670,000 visitors. The tours, educational tours, are attended by more than 400,000 people per year. The operating budget is more than $21 million. And the staff is, it's a 75, now it's about 85. It was founded in the year 1966 in a small group of volunteers that were trying to save some historical buildings, historical heritage that was supposed to be replaced by a new modern development in the downtown Chicago on the basis of the rising prices and uh, the need to create more revenue. But these pe people of culture, they said, actually, this is our identity. We have to preserve some of these buildings, some of them by very notable architects, of course. It was completely grassroots activity. Yeah? It was not top down. But it was sheer activism, sheer activism, yeah. Completely non-profit. What is interesting, yeah, when we go back to nowadays from the faraway history, Chicago Architecture Foundation actually discussed and is putting into operation a strategic development plan that was written in 2016, and it says that they want Chicago Action Center to become a leading forum for architecture and urban planning. They want to partner with Chicago communities, so to be really, really anchored in the communities, local communities. And number three, that's very important, they want the center to be a national leader for youth engagement. Youth engagement. That's something that is quite unusual because uh, not many architecture programs or urban planning, planning related programs are targeted to children. This is the, I don't know if we, you, can, you can probably hardly see it, but this is the structure of the team that is consisting of 83 workers or members, 23 staff, uh, 83 staff. You see that the biggest number of people are employed in the commercial activities, but under these commercial activities, you have to imagine, for example, guided tours that are, these are educational guided tours that are uh, paid for, yes, uh, you buy tickets. Then you have the biggest group, the second biggest group is the youth education that is completely non-profit. Then marketing, yeah, 13 people. 
about 8% of all revenue goes to marketing, and uh, that's very important. Office management, that this is the management of the team and the premises. And then you have fundraising programs for adults, yeah, very, very minor. And the direction, director, no, with her assistant. When looking at it in real, you know, these were just very, very uh, uh, dry facts. This is Lane Osmond. For 20 years, she's a director of uh, Chicago Actors Center. And you can see also all the other directors of these diverse sections you saw. Youth Education, Gabe, yeah. Mike is for the, for the business, yeah, and so on. Uh, you can also see that in the management structure, uh, there is an interesting proportion of women and men as to the discipline of architecture. No? It is a more educational uh, institution. So in America, as in Europe, most of the managers of architecture firms are men and uh, white males, yes, white. In this case, because everyone is white as well, but you can see uh, five of the eight are women, yes, so it's an interesting proportion. But when we ask about how many of the 83 staff are architects, that's, com that's coming to the very interesting point. How many of the 83 staff do have education in architecture, you think? From 83. Zero. So Milota says zero, yes. You said 30? 30? 30. 30, yes. So Milota is a little bit closer, yes. Who else? 15. 15, no, Milota is closer, yes. <laughs> <laughs> One, even better, yes, almost there, almost there. <laughs> Three. Three, yes, yes. So out of 83 staff, only three are educated as architects, yeah. The thing is that at the beginning, there were many more architects, yes, in this uh, institution, in this Chicago Architecture Center. But they said that it was very complicated with them. Yeah, they were complicating everything, yes. They could not express themselves in a very clear and understandable way. Yeah, so they actually kicked them out, yeah, nicely, yeah, uh, politely, and hired educators. Yeah, that's completely different profession, no? or partly different pro profession. It could be combined, but educator and architect, it's a different profession. And very specifically, interpreters. Because architecture interpretation, that's a profession of its own. This is Gabe uh, on the less formal picture. Yeah, when she welcomed me in the office on the first day, you can see that uh, the working environment in uh, the buildings by Miss van der Rohe is really very uh, unbearable. Yeah, you just work under the artificial light all day long because uh, the floors are very deep and uh, so you are very far from the window all the time and uh, so you don't know if it's morning or evening, if it's winter or summer because the fluorescent light is all the same all, all, all the year long yeah, and makes you really dizzy. Yeah? And uh, so only when there is a meeting of the directors you can see what the Daytime is outside behind the window. So uh, when coming back to this building, yeah, the uh, let's say the the uh, center itself that is open to public is on the on the ground floor, and the offices are at the same building but on the thirteenth floor. Yeah, that's also a funny story because it's a non-profit organization, and of course the rents in the downtown Chicago are super high. Only the 13th floor, no one wants, because it brings bad luck, yes. <laughs> so it's very cheap, and for NGOs, I think, and for uh, and, and non-profit organizations, it's actually a perfect catch, yes. Uh, 
was no lawyers, you know. It's, it's really bringing bad luck, you know, like if you are on the 13th floor. Yeah, some of the hotels in, I've been in San Francisco, the elevator doesn't have really the button for the 13th floor. There is, it doesn't exist, yeah. I was really shocked. I think in Europe we are, we are not that, uh, not that uh, crazy about this, but business is business. So, let's focus on the ground floor now. This used to be an open space, now it's sealed up, and a new, uh, let's say, uh, kind of institution was created. Uh, there is the entrance desk, uh, entrance counter, and the ground floor, and galleries, and lecture halls, and workshops upstairs. This is uh, uh, the opening of the new architecture center in the year nine, tw 2018. 2018, yeah. So it's four years ago, even even less. This is the director, uh, Lynn Osmond, and the mayor of the city. That's very significant. That the mayor is seeing the importance of this institution in the city of Chicago and has no problem to come with the big scissors and show up uh, uh, because he is proud of having this archaeology center in his town. Yeah? Because the Chicago is the capital of architecture. What I actually say is to be an architect in Chicago is like be a Muslim in Mecca. Yeah? And it's a uh, it is uh, really one of the main topics, yeah, the baseball game and architecture. Yeah, so that's when you go on the L metro, metro line in the evening, people are chatting on either of the two topics. Yes, on the either of the two topics. So, uh, actually, uh, I went through all of these programs they are, they are uh, delivering to the public, they are actually producing, creating, discussing, and, and uh, offering. Uh, and uh, so I actually, uh, I, I really was deep into these, uh, these uh, uh, meetings and all the design, design meetings and everything, because I was there right at the moment when they were finalizing this new center, yeah, I was also, in person on the opening at the end, and I was one of the first uh, first uh, Chicago Architecture Center official guides that were trained. Yeah, so I have the official certificate of being a guide, exhibition guide uh, uh, of the Chicago Architecture Center. They have four exhibitions there. Yeah, all four are very different again and very interesting. I will start from the last one. The, this exhibition is called Out of the Window. And because of the very exclusive location of the architecture center, uh, you can see the city right behind the window. So when you stand inside, you have a beautiful panorama of very famous buildings from the Wrigley Building to, to Marina City and so on by famous architects. And uh, this... Uh, Description actually explains you what you see. Yeah, on the very very far left, you could even see the Trump Tower, but it was not included on this exhibition. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It seemed like it was a really really sensitive issue. Yeah. The uh, another exhibition that was the interior exhibition is the Chicago Gallery. Yeah. Then it's from me to V and building tall. We go in more detail. Chicago Gallery consists of more than 400,000 buildings that are, as a collection, creating the amazing model of downtown Chicago. Uh, the model is animated by lights and film, so every half an hour there is an eight-minute film that is screened behind the model, and uh, the, the spotlights are actually animating the model synchronized uh, with the film, and it explains the history of the city, where it started, how it grew, and what were the big fire, what was the big fire, and so on, and why after the big fire, fire the city was completely rebuilt 
and especially with the high-rise buildings. No, that was the big revolution. Yeah. Then, when the film is over, there are four tablets, and on the tablets you can find another 20 plus topics you can actually connect uh, uh, with with the model again, and uh, you can uh, understand more stories about the city. On the walls around, you have six subtopics around this model. Chicago, city of architecture, why it's seen as a city of architecture. Yeah? When you speak about all American cities, for example, none of the cities except of Chicago is seen as a city of architecture. Yeah? This is important to, to say. Yeah? So this is a capital of architecture in the United States. Uh, then, what are the building blocks of Chicago? These are the main design principles of the city, such as the railway line, because the, it was most important railway, railway crossing and actually the exchange place for the goods and freight uh, from between the rail, uh, uh, different railroads, uh, connecting all the country. And the, the waterfront, yeah, Lake Michigan, yeah, it was forming uh, very, very, in a very, very important way. And also it has a very important uh, climatic uh, uh, impact on the city. At Home in Chicago describes a very specific uh, housing types. Yeah? So this from the bungalow, it's kind of a one family house, to the courtyard building that is kind of an apartment building, U-shaped around the inner courtyard, semi-opened, and high rises that, uh, these are residential high rises that are actually here illustrated by one of the towers of the Mies van der Rohe Lakeshore Drive project. Another topic are architects that are connected with Chicago. Yeah. Could you name some famous architects connected with Chicago? Have any idea? Now, I mentioned already Mies van der Rohe, right? Yeah. So he, he emigrated with uh, his Bauhaus school before the Second World War to the United States. But probably Louis Sullivan, no, starting from the oldest ones, Frank Lloyd Wright, no, the, the most important archive of the 20th century, uh, uh, and so and so on and so forth. And the last exhibition is speaking about the current projects. And this is, uh, let's say, uh, exhibition that is uh, rotating. It's uh, every month or every two months. There is a new project on display. In this case, for example, was the actual project of the Obama Presidential Center, uh, the uh, uh, Chicago South. The second exhibition, now only we are going upstairs. We are getting upstairs now. There is, there is an exhibition that speaks about the future. Yeah? So one exhibition was about the past. This is about the future. It's called From Me to We. Imagining the city of 2050. What are the major challenges is described here on the wall of challenges. What are the best answers by best architects, architecture planners, urban planners is on the wall of answers. What are the future megacities in the world are on this wall. You can see that neither North America or Europe are actually highlighted, but it's mostly Equatorial Africa and Southeast Asia. And the imagining of the city creates kind of a complete. They invited also the local architecture firms uh, to find uh, solutions and answers. And last, but actually the most important exhibition and the central piece of all this center is huge exhibition yeah, you can see the beautiful view behind the windows, no? what I was speaking about before. Right across the street is the Norman Foster's uh, um, Apple, Apple store. Yeah, beautiful one. Yeah. And uh, uh, Building Tall is the, let's say, central exhibition. Building Tall. Why Building Tall? Chicago is a place where one very specific typology of architecture was innovated and was first realized. And it is, what is it? 
a skyscraper. Yeah. Skyscraper was born in Chicago. Yeah. What is even more interesting is, even it was born more than 100 years ago, still the firms that are designing skyscrapers, yeah, at certain moment, the highest ones, the tallest ones, were built in Chicago, but it's not anymore. They are being the tallest ones now built in Dubai and, and, uh, and in China. But still, the designers of these globally tallest buildings are these firms, architecture firms, are still based in Chicago until today. So all the knowledge, the design knowledge, the technology is still in Chicago. Yeah, that's very unique. So these are the four anchors, the big models. You see uh, Marina, uh, Hancock Tower, yeah, and so on. You can see small models like here, you know, this Ger Gherkin. Actually, this model, I was flying myself from, from, from Norman Foster's office in, in, in San Francisco. It was three days before the opening of the exhibition. And Lynn didn't have anyone to send there. I was the only available as a Fulbright grantee. And she told me, Osamu, do you have a free weekend? Yeah. <laughs> I said, no, OK. So what's the, what's the question? And uh, she told me, like, in two hours, you fly to San Francisco. Yeah, and I went to the, so I flew to San Francisco. It was great, actually, it was amazing. That's America, so. Uh, but the problem was that the box, I, it was, it was, it's an art piece, no? The model is art piece. So the insurance of sending it by a post would be enormous, yeah. So that's what actually uh, Lynn had in mind when she asked me because it was the only way how to smuggle this artwork in the cabin luggage space, <laughs> pretending it's nothing valuable, you know? So it was clearly like contraband. It was like, I was really feeling like uh, we are doing some criminal act or something. And luckily, there was just five millimeters missing to fit it exactly into the luggage space. Otherwise, all the effort would be lost. If it wouldn't fit, in that space, I could actually never put it down there. Yeah, it was just, it would not work. So it was so stressful. But this is the exhibition, yeah. I'm not sure. Uh, on the walls again, uh, there are the stories that are depicting uh, how is it to design the, the world's tallest buildings, such as Burj Khalifa. Yeah, you see the story of Burj Khalifa. What are all the innovations that are needed to build tall from the skeleton steel frame to the reinforced concrete to the high speed elevator to the very efficient uh, air conditioning and all this only coming together makes this possible. The, there is also a seat and exhibition for the best tall buildings in the world that is an uh, annual competition and the architects that I mentioned before that are mostly based in Chicago and that are designing these amazing structures. But this exhibition, if it would be in Europe probably, that would be already a masterpiece, you know. It would be a real, it was, it's very nicely designed. The interpretation work is done in an amazing, amazing way. But what is hidden and you cannot see is the let's say, service that is actually uh, provided to the visitor of this center. All these people are volunteers. These are 150 plus volunteers who give their free time to get through a very, very difficult training uh, so that they could host uh, visitors in this exhibition every day, yeah, in their free time for no money just because they love their city, they love architecture, and they love to tell the visitors about their city and, archi and its architecture. So these people are taking the two-day course, intensive course. This is a textbook for the exhibit host handbook. Actually, that's my copy. And this, and this you have to go through different uh, 
tasks. You know this about the history of the city. You have to put all the historical events in the right order. You have to learn about all these important exhibits so that you know by heart where is the smallest detail at this exhibition so that they, so that actually when the visitor is coming, you can jump on him on or her and ask, hi, how are you? May I help you? What are, what, what are you interested in? Where are you from? No, where are you from? That's the, that's the buzzword. No, where are you from? You know, and from there, the conversation, conversation starts. And you can then start to tell the story of architecture. This is the shop. Yeah, this is the museum shop. You can buy a lot of books on architecture and games and t-shirts on architecture and pencils and everything. So you can just start from the scratch. And this is the counter. It's not, uh, it's not at the airport. It's uh, the place where you buy a ticket for your architecture tour. Yeah? These tours are educational tours. So that makes a great difference from the, all the other commercial tours in the city that are just commercial tours, yeah? Because this culture institution, they are very much proud of very high quality of the service they do and of the information they provide. Uh, there are about 18 plus tours daily, yeah? Yeah, and uh, these tours are actually creating the major revenue, as I mentioned before, for uh, this center. Uh, when you want to buy a ticket for such a tour, of course, most of the people do it online. It's from $26 for the, for the, let's say, one and a half hour tour, walking tour in the downtown that starts actually at the center. That's why the location is so important, because it's a start of the walking tours. $275, that is maybe full day bus tour of the Chicago suburbs. So, sightseeing. Uh, a top 10 chart, yeah, so in the top 10 is in the US, in the whole US, yeah, is the Statue of Liberty, you know, but in the top 10 is the architecture boat tour on the Chicago River by the Chicago Architecture Center, yeah, so there's the cruise ship, uh, there is this uh, docent, yeah, so-called docent, there's the guide who is this is very, very carefully trained how to interpret architecture. They are not actually speaking only about interpreting architecture. They are speaking about staging architecture, yeah? how to stage architecture. So it has also, it has almost uh, theatrical moments, yes, because they are also training uh, how to create a surprise moments or aha moments, how to, how to go around the building, you know, where to point uh, your attention, you know, how to, how to navigate you, you know, so it's a, so it's a really performance, yeah, it's, it's a real performance and, uh, and the main actor in this performance is the city and its architecture. You have the bus tours, architecture bus tour, there's a double decker bus with the open deck, so it looks like you are on a boat. This is in the Chinatown of Chicago, for example. So we have a very close contact with all the buildings. You can almost touch the buildings. And when there are the trees in the Little Italy, you have to bend down because the, the branches are just combing your hair. So architecture metro tours, yeah. The Chicago metro is elevated. It's not underground, it's not subway. So so-called L, so you can, from the windows, you can see a lot of architecture, especially in the inner loop of the city. And you, at some stops, stations, you get out. Some sta stations are of a historical relevance or there are some very interesting buildings around it. So from the platform, you see again some buildings, you hop on another train and you continue. And architecture walks that are most popular. When we were speaking about the bus tours, so that's for the, let's say, longer tours, there are 15 plus. This is the uh, guided architecture tour to Farnsworth House by Miss van der Rohe. It's a one day trip or to the Oak Park neighborhood that is uh, mostly, or there, there's the biggest collection of buildings by Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright, including the, the Unity Temple. Five of these buildings were just listed, I think, two years ago on the UNESCO World Heritage 
list. Who are these guides? Who are these so-called docents? Yeah. These are these amazing ladies. Yeah. Uh, mostly, not, not only, but these are actually my photos, so, so these are the real people. Uh, they are, most of them are retired. Most of them were in their previous profession on very interesting positions, either teachers, professors, but even bankers. I made even a banker. Yeah, so uh, they just are giving their own private time. They have it uh, also as a kind of a service, but also it's definitely also entertaining. This interaction is bringing them into the community and they really serve with all their hearts. Yeah, the most difficult is actually when I was speaking with the manager of these volunteers, what, was the most what is the most difficult moment? She told me, you know, Osamu, when this lady, when they get too old to be able to guide anymore, that's very, very emotional moment, yes, because they don't want to stop. And we buy a big bucket of uh, big, 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 big uh, flowers, and we buy champagne, and we make really nice farewell party, but it's very emotional, a lot of tears. And it's like that. This is the uh, classroom for small kids, mostly elementary schools, attending uh, programs that are for schools. So it's like one studio, 33, 36 kids. And these are some of the programs yeah, uh, that, they are, that, that are on offer. Sustainable X design, yeah, how to become a sustainable architecture designer in two weeks yeah, when you are a high schooler. Yeah, that was my favorite. I actually was also taking part in it as a consultant. Girls build. Yeah. As I mentioned before, in this profession, very few women architects. So this is a special course designed for girls not to be afraid to become architects. Yeah. And Angela, she's one of the three. Yeah, she's the one with the camera. She's one of the three really trained architects in the whole team, yes, from New York. So Hip Hop Architecture Camp, my favorite, again. Yeah, Hip Hop Architecture Camp for African Americans from the Chicago South and Chicago West that has the highest rate of criminality. STEM Studio and Teen Academy. So again, this is a little close up to the uh, sustainable X design. Yeah, sustainable X design in four pictures. So in first day, you try to find out more about the architecture design process from the brief location, uh, let's say analysis, brief from the client, and so on and so on, and first stage of the, of the uh, schematic design, so on and so on. Uh, then, so you actually try to understand what is the right order yeah, of, the, of the design process. Then you start to follow this process. You study uh, the local regulations of the site, the program, and you find about the maximum possible volumes uh, just to know what is the envelope you have to fit in. You look at the land use plan of the city, it's very easy. And then you design a nice, nice project in a team yeah, and present it. It's uh, two weeks, yes. Uh, Hip Hop Architecture Camp with Mike Ford. Yeah. Mike Ford is, has graduated from architecture school, but his big love is music. Yeah. Uh, and uh, especially hip hop. Yeah. So he's a rapper. He's a rapper. Yeah. And uh, it's five day workshop. Five day workshop. And it goes like this. Yeah. It goes like this. Uh, kids are between 10 and 15, age of 10 and 15, yeah, age. So at the very beginning, you start with the analysis of hip hop songs because the lyrics of the hip hop songs are very critical about 
everything you see around you, mostly the city and criminality. Yeah. So you are trying to find their rhymes. And where the rhymes are corresponding, uh, they are the strong points. You put a special, uh, you mark it out. And it creates your structure. These are the gray bricks. Yeah. You transform it into the Lego blocks. And this creates the underlayer. Then you discuss, then you go through the functional analysis and you discuss what are the problems in your community, what is missing, and what should be added to make the life in the neighborhood better. Yeah. This is already kind of a strategical plan. And these orange papers ideas you transform into the orange blocks and you add to these empty and void and dysfunctional places in the song of the city. Then you zoom in into one of these buildings, such as a beautiful uh, elementary school building or new community center. You design it in the Tinkercad, that is a special AutoCAD for kids, and you 3D printed on the 3D printer next room. You put it in your pockets and you leave with this your own design home. And you remember for all your life that these problems that are surrounding you are solvable through design thinking process. But that's not all, it's five days, so it's a very long time. In the parallel, in a group, you compose your own song, your own, own hymn of your city. The song of the city of Chicago, and you create a musical video. What up, y'all? This song is dedicated to those impacted by rail lines in the city of Chicago. This army of future architects want to do something about that. Tinkercad, yes. Build the hood up. Put the guns, guns down, yeah. This is the model, yeah. These are the lyrics. She speaks about the crimes she can see with her eyes on the street there. Three people gunned down in a week. Do you understand? This the land use plan. What can we build for a parents who lost their child in the violence? Yeah. Wake up Chicago, this end fantasy. So that's like in Bratislava, no? <laughs> so, on top of that, the Chicago Architecture Center uh, is producing interesting uh, textbooks for kids. Yeah, these two are more for the for the teachers, but the one on the right, No Small Plans, is an illustrated novel for Chicago youth. 
There were, this book was completely crowdsourced, crowdfunded. There was a public competition on the scenario. There was a lot of participatory process of the, of the youth in the Chicago on the script. And it was actually uh, crowdsourced with many locals and local firms so that 30,000 copies of this textbook could be distributed to each single student of a Chicago public school for free. This novel has three parts. The first one depicting the past, past problems of the city, such as the racial segregation or uh, let's say environmental problems, the presence, yeah, it's the gentrification and these developers, you know, uh, hungry for all the, let's say, uh, local communities, places, you know, and so on. And the future, yeah. And it's supposed to explain how important it is to participate in the future and present development of the city, because without your own involvement, the city would definitely go wrong. When you go through the book, and I opened it first time, I was very nervous because you start, because from here I'm, I was uh, somehow expecting that I will find a lot of good solutions how to make things better, you know. But when I went through this book, first page, big problem. Second page, even bigger problem. And third page, mega problem, you know. And then you end, end all the book and you don't find any solutions. And then you are really stressed out and then you go and become an architect. <laughs> yeah, so this is the so-called problem-oriented learning that is very, let's say, home to the Anglo-Saxon countries. It's so different from our Austrian-Hungarian past. But it makes kids to think and to try to find their own solutions they will meet in their futures. Because we are able only to teach them solutions to the problems of today, but these problems might not be the same problems of the future. Again, as in all the other cases, there is not just a book, there is not just an exhibition, but there is a special training to the book. These are the teachers who want to work with this book, and they are undergoing two-day, very intense course how to work with the book. Every, to every single illustrated page of the book, there are three pages of a reader, how you can work with that page, what kind of problems are being uh, illustrated there, and what kind of exercises you can develop on top of it. And here they ex exchange their experience from different courses they develop on this book. And of course, it's very interactive, yeah. And, and from the impoverished neighborhoods, they actually invite the teachers for free. They pay uh, for their lunches, travel, everything. So they just, uh, so the city center is supporting them, yeah, because it's not, of course, uh, cheap to spend two days in this training program. And this is, uh, let's say, more, uh, you can see this everywhere. It's a lecture hall, a lecture, a lecture hall yeah, this for, uh, programs for typically for the adults, for experts. These are some of the formats that are being presented there. Architecture talks, architecture that is being finalized behind the curtain program, partner programs, because the center has many partners, like from the industry. And, and there are like the members only programs, yeah, because the member, membership uh, uh, concept is very, very uh, widespread in the US and it actually, uh, brings the community together around these uh, institutions, and so on. And last, not, last but not least is the Open House Chicago, because the, the Chicago Action Center is also hosting this uh, worldwide event. The Open House Chicago is the second largest in the world. It takes two days, 
in 2017 it was 257 buildings in 20 neighborhoods and about 90,000 visitors attended. Interesting is that all was managed by only two people, yeah, one plus one permanent and one ter temp half, half, uh, half time staff. Yeah. Actually, he was completely collapsing. Yeah, he was really a completely dead person. Yes, but it was an amazing event. So, this is the open house Chicago. It's growing. You know, it's typical American. I think not very, not very sustainable, but nice to see. Uh, and uh, there is still there is an on, online uh, platform for uh, how teaching design. Yeah, I'm not going to the detail here because we will have no time for discussion then. Uh, there is an International Association of Architecture Organizations that all the centers around the world that are similar, you might know some, you might know the Arsenal in Paris, you might know Deutsches Architektur Center, you might know New London Architecture, you might know, you might know the uh, um, Danish Architecture Center blocks, and so on and so on. ACV, yeah, it's just nearby. Uh, so some of these are members, they are exchanging the, their experience, they are, they are cooperating together. Yeah. For example, when the blocks in Copenhagen was founded, they actually hired the, pro the former program director from Chicago to develop their public programs. And the website, that has a very nice address, www.architecture.org. So this is the red dot thing. So to conclude, yes, uh, the key question for me is how to make our cities more understandable, accessible, and just via better sharing to foster democracy. Today we spend more and more time in the digital and online world. Therefore, the way how we perceive city today, how we experience it, and what we expect from it is radically changing. Our theatrical performance, virtual ritual, that we have developed even with Milota here, about the current city, about the intertwining of gaming and digital worlds, and related problems, it's possible to see at international theater festivals now, all across Europe, we will play it now in a Nitra, yeah? it's the urban planning performance, theater performance. Yeah. It's another interesting format I'm now developing based on the experience from what I witnessed and, uh, and actually lived through in Chicago earlier. Because a city, okay, sorry, we have a special morning performance of the theater. And that morning performance is reserved for school kids only, for students. Because a city that is losing its youngest generation is losing its future. This is also in the background of my last project. Three years ago, I wrote an illustrated book for children about the city and its planning. It's called Město pro každého, or City for Everyone, which has been translated to English and will be soon published in German, Russian, Korean, and simplified Chinese. The German version will be out just now in April. The book was sold and distributed in thousands of copies already. And here in Bratislava, you can also get it. For example, in Art Forum bookstore. Now, being the new dean of the Faculty of Arts and Architecture 
of the Technical University of Liberec, people ask me, Osamu, so who is planning the city? So I tell them, it's not just urban planners, politicians and developers who are planning the city. Each of us is planning a city by how we behave and move in the city every day. It's you every morning when you decide how to go to the city, get in the car, and soon you will be suffocating in endless car traffic jams, along with lots of other people who are mutually alienated. Go on foot, and soon you will wake up in a safe city where you will get easily to everywhere and everyone. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Osamu. Uh, maybe a small time for questions from you, there is the possibility. Please, take your hand and I will put you with this. So, if I may, I have two questions uh, for you, Mr. Okamura. Uh, do you think, if it's possible, here in Central Europe, uh, make something like Chicago Architecture Center and if people in this area would be interested in such activities. And the second question is, I was, I was quite, quite shocked, shocked when you said the, the center has, uh, has only three members who are, are with uh, architecture education. So if you think we should be more uh, educated in form of communication with general public or to express our ideas more understandably? Yes, good questions, very good questions. I start from the second one. And many schools, it started in Grenoble in France. They are starting to teach to architecture students how to transmit architecture and to ha how to interpret architecture. So within, within their bachelor curricula, there is a subject, there is a course, where they actually learn and train how to interact with general public and or with kids. Yeah. So they develop workshops, they develop exercises, and they interact with uh, people from other bubbles. And they learn this skill because during their professional life, it's actually one of the very important skills that helps them to communicate architecture ideas in much more comprehensive and understandable way. Uh, at our school, at the Faculty of Arts and Architecture in Liberec, I'm teaching the same course. It's called Project Presentation in English. It's a two-term course. And, we, and there's a course that I have actually developed during my eight years tenure at the ARCHIP, uh, architecture School in Prague, that is International Private uh, School of Architecture. I worked there on, for eight years on this course, and now for the second year I'm teaching in Liberec. And I'm trying to build on all this experience from, the, from, from what I went through, because I think it's very important. It's very important. And it's more and more and more important. More and more architects are actually also trying to uh, change the planning policies, entering the, uh, the co in the cooperation with municipalities. Yeah, as uh, city architects, they have these special uh, offices of participation. You no, know, like MIB has, for example. Yeah, and uh, this is exactly the place where the architecture meets the public and uh, where 
this special role of interpretation architecture is so much needed. Yeah. So I believe it should be in the curriculum of every architecture student. Yeah. I believe. I believe. It's not yet. Uh, it's not yet. But I hope. Yeah. The second thing is, if it's possible to develop some architecture center like this in uh, here in Bratislava, that's ex or Czech Republic. We are doing exactly that in the summer term, summer term uh, with our students. We are designing uh, the Liberec Architecture Center. Yeah, that's the brief task for all summer term. So we are researching on the best practice of all European or different European cities, how they present architecture. We, we look specifically and research on the architecture centers in, in uh, I mentioned, you know, like Arsenal, New London Architecture, ATZV, and so on, so on. Uh, the students just look online, they visit, and so on. And uh, in cooperation with the city office, uh, planning office of, of Liberec, we uh, are looking for the locations in our city that would be the most suitable, what are the important buildings that have very nice contact with the with the street level and are nicely loca located that this could be actually the starting point of the tours and so on. And now City of Liberec is, is uh, preparing a bid for a European Capital of Culture 2028. And uh, we just inserted it uh, as one of the projects in there that is in discussion might probably happen in 2028 or, or maybe earlier. Yeah, so why not? In Prague, there is camp, yeah? So camp is exactly that. Even camp is financed by the city itself, and it was founded by the city itself. So it's top down, yeah? So it's top down, yeah? So it's again different. What we saw here, it was, it's really like grassroots activity, started as a grass, grassroots, and even today it's completely independent, independent. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's not, it's not prof profitable. It's not run for profit. Uh, the profit is reinvested, but all this stuff are well paid. Yeah, so I can assure you. Yeah, and uh, to the European standards, very well paid. <laughs> I was surprised. Yeah, <laughs> so so it's actually amazing job. It's an amazing service you can do. You can start it right now, right there, right here. Yeah, and probably maybe Bratislava is also preparing some something like that. The city of Bratislava, it's possible. But uh, I think every major city should have this, and architects and architecture students, especially, and doctoral students, most of, the, of it should be definitely involved, because it's a place to present research, interact with public, give lectures, uh, make interesting exhibitions, and to bring interesting ideas and concepts, you know, and inspire your city. Yeah, yeah. Look out. Yeah. So, thank you. Uh, I have a question because this was all pre, pre COVID time, a lot of uh, formats which are physical. Uh, has something changed uh, in the dramaturgy of that foundation, or have you been catching up with them? And if so something stayed, you know? Unfortunately, I don't know. Yeah, yeah because I've been there 2018. Yeah, and uh, I was not in contact with the uh, Chicago Action Foundation since. Even I met occasionally someone, but, uh, but it's quite far away, and uh, the closure, the COVID closure was just quite extreme. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, yeah, yeah. I don't know even if they had to scale down the stuff or something, because uh, I cannot imagine they could have, could they could pay it all the years through without having uh, any uh, visitors, yeah. So, so uh, it's it's also my big question, yeah, yeah. Maybe I should look at it as well and uh, try to bring some some more knowledge and information about how they react. Because we are talking now uh, from all sides, not only like participation, but all the city formats, like like discussion are over lectures. This is a big surprise. Why you come here? Because of you. Otherwise, I click on you. You know, like. The re reformatting is happening, and we must speak about it if we want to communicate it better and want people to come. So, COVID was a trigger. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah.
Ja. Any other questions? If not, thank you thank again, you again. Osamu. Thank you that the first April in Bratislava was not only joking, <laughs> but was also a very <laughs> uh, a little bit serious and very very interesting. I hope that uh, we personally together uh, will meet in two week, uh, two months, two months, in frame of the defense of the diploma project at our Faculty of Architecture and Design. And I hope that we together will meet again next Friday. The next guest will be Professor Eva Jizicna. We will have connection with London, and I hope it will be also very interesting. And so at this moment, thanks again, Osamu. Thanks Thank you to very you. much. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Have a nice day and a nice weekend. Goodbye. Yes.